the cloud. There we are. <laughs> Amazing robotic voice there. Okay, so I'll just get myself sorted out and then I will begin. Right, so good evening everyone. So I'm going to be talking tonight about Jomon Japan, Stone Circles and World Heritage. Bit of a mouthful. And um, I'd like to acknowledge the support of the, the Daiwa Anglo-Japanese Foundation and the Sainsbury Institute in this. And the reasons for that will become clear in a moment. It's a bit of an odd story because we were hoping, we were planning to host what would have been a really interesting exhibition, looking at the way that Japanese contemporary artists have been looking at um, prehistoric Japan and that using that as an inspiration. And we had teamed up with the Sainsbury Institute and a bunch of artists, the, the, who, uh, they call, their movement, they call themselves Jomonism. Um, and they, we would have brought across an amazing selection of artwork to the UK um, and also one or two objects that from prehistoric Japan that would sort of illustrate the, the inspiration behind the, the artist's work. Um, and this was, we were aiming for the badge of the Japan UK season of culture, which of course was going to run uh, up to and including the 2020, 2020 Olympiad. Now, for obvious reasons, that didn't quite happen, which is a big shame. But um, well, the, the reason for this is that we had been working with the Sainsbury Institute for a number of years. They run a program bringing um, students across, but in particular from Japan. Uh, they bring them to a whole bunch of sites and um, museums and meet all sorts of people for about a week in the UK. And we're on their, their visits. They come and visit us, find out about running a small museum in the middle of nowhere or the centre of Wiltshire, depending on which way you look at it, and how that links to world heritage. And we also met some of the team uh, from Japan who were working on a bid for these sites, the Jomon sites, uh, for world heritage site status. So unfortunately, it didn't quite work out. But there's a long tradition of links between Stonehenge and Japan, not least of which is stone circles. Now, this is a, a photo um, as you can see, of the Stonehenge Committee at Stonehenge, April the 12th, 1901. Um, an amazing selection of hats. Now, now, the person who's particularly interesting is this one here, and his name is William Gowland. And he'll be well known to some of you because he was the first person to really uh, conduct excavations at Stonehenge. And he was brought in to uh, look after the monument and to sort of straighten a number of the stones and put them back. And so this is him, uh, here we are, him supervising the work at Stonehenge. Now, William Gowland actually learned his archaeology uh, in Japan. He was a mining engineer, went to Japan, and started, essentially got, started excavating sites. And he started to understand the prehistory of Japan. So when he came back to the UK, he was a very skilled archaeologist. And, he, and because of his interest in uh, his interest, he was asked to take on this work at Stonehenge. And that's sort of the starting point for quite a long tradition of links. Um, the English, we were planning to do an exhibition with um, well, alongside English Heritage, and that would have kicked off in September 2020. And that would have looked very much at William Gowland and the links between the stone circles of Japan and the UK. And these are, this is a group of the students from uh, Japan who visited in 2017. And here, Simon Kaner, who's the chap who makes all these things happen. Amazing uh, tour de force. So I was invited um, as one of an, a team of uh, English heritage staff and with Sarah Simmons of the um, the Stonehenge and Avery World Heritage Site Coordination Unit to go to visit uh, Japan. And so um, what I'm going to do is talk you through our visit and show you some of the, uh, the stone circles and talk, talk about one or two of the other things that uh, we did while we were there as well. 
So we flew into Tokyo, which is just here in Japan. And well, I'm sure you've all seen sort of TV pictures and so on of Japan and Tokyo is as mad and as busy as you might think. It was a you know, really bewildering experience. I've been to one or two places in my time, but um, uh, sort of faced with somewhere where you don't, where you can't understand a word of the language, let alone read it, is really quite challenging. But in fact, a number of sort of signs on the subway are in English. But it was still, you know, quite quite challenging. And we on, on the first day we walked from the main station to go and see the Imperial Palace. And this is one of the really bizarre things we found en route. Um, what you see on the right hand side, I didn't like to be too um, obvious in taking a photograph. This is a Shinto shrine put up for the 2019 um, Rugby World Cup. Uh, this is the mascot and this is uh, Sarah Simmons from the World Heritage Site Coordination Unit having her photo taken with the, with the mascot. Um, I'm not sure what this chap was doing. I think this is a, an industrial sized hoover to clean, keep the pavements clean. And so here's a group shot of the team. So many of you will recognize, so that's Sarah, that's me. Many of you will recognize Sarah Greeny. Um, and here's Junzo who uh, was looked after us on our visit. And this chap, um, he obviously got out of the wrong side of bed in the morning. <clears throat> so our first, sort of real visit was to the stone circles at Oyu and if you remember Tokyo is down here the sort of off the bottom of the screen we were really visiting this area the northern part of the southern island um, of Japan and this there are two stone circles at Oyu this is the first um, the uh, where are we this is the southern circle and doesn't quite look like the, the circles we're used to. As you can see, a series of small stones dotted in an outer circle, an inner circle, and then one standing. So quite a different sort of experience of what these stone circles are and how they work. The stone setting is really quite interesting. They get called sundials uh, for obvious reasons. So a single stone set upright and a series of smaller stones set radially inside and outer curb. Um, and this is the other circle, the northern circle. Again, you see the scatter of stones in a circle. And these thatched huts, these are reconstructed on the site of, uh, on the site of the evidence, which is a series of large post holes. Uh, the assumption is that these are thatched buildings. And this is where things get to be quite interesting because their stone circles are in many ways quite different to ours. Um, and in the center of this one, uh, again, is a radial setting. But the, it isn't, they don't just have stone circles, there are also radial lines of stones, as you see, heading out from the circle. So there is more to it. And the one at Oyu is particularly interesting for Japanese archeologists because it's the first place where they recognized that there were solstitial alignments. So this is the first stone circle with the, um, uh, the sundial set off center. And this is the center second with the sundial in the center. And what, uh, by looking at the alignments, they realize that you take line through the two sundials and that gives you the summer, uh, the sunset at the summer solstice line. So there's a very definite link, linkage there to uh, solar alignments. And this is something that has a long tradition in um, Japan. You see here, this is a Shinto shrine linked to the setting, uh, the, the dawn, where the sun rises between two particularly um, propitious mountains. Uh, this is up at, in, this is the island of Hokkaido. And then the, uh, the Oyo stone circles have uh, a site museum. And this is a really impressive place in many ways. Um, I could spend hours talking about it, but just to highlight a few things. The, the uh, amazing range of pottery vessels were found at the site. The site, as you can see, was completely excavated. 
And these really are stupendous, and you'll be seeing a few more uh, as we go through. And here we have a close up of a couple of them. As you see, really um, expertly made, not wheel thrown, they're hand, handmade, but you see these amazing bulbous things. You know, they really go overboard on the decoration. These are cooking vessels, and uh, certainly they're used for cooking. You know, there's a very, very much smoke and smoke blackened, and there is some evidence of fats on the inside as well. So these are cooking vessels, but really are making them incredibly decorated as well. But the thing that I find, in fact, Japanese archaeologists find absolutely fascinating are these things, which are called dogu. And these are little human figurines. But as you can see, they're all broken. Um, so this one missing its body, it's you just have the, uh, the head and arms. This one, the, um, the head broken off. And as you can see, they're all in pieces. Now, the site was completely excavated pretty well. And so you might ask where the other bits are. And that's where things get really interesting because the other bits aren't there. Um, and although the pieces very much are in the same place, the other section, the other bits of these figurines are definitely not there. And you put the, those little post structures together with the dogu and the missing pieces. And you start to be able to perhaps tell a story, which is that there are a number of um, holes in the ground, which seem to contain nothing apart from dogu and broken pottery. Um, this, this is, um, as you will know, Japan is uh, volcanic. It's on the ring of fire around the Pacific. And the soil is very acidic, which means that, that bone doesn't survive. So there are one or two burials in other parts, in parts where the soil is less acidic or where people are, were actually buried in pots. And it starts to become clear that these are cemeteries and that people are buried in holes in the ground. The pots are broken in order for it to be placed with the body. And the dogu are broken as well. And the implication is that some of the pieces are buried with the person, some are kept by the family. So perhaps these are made to represent the spirit of the person who has died. And by taking this pieces of the dogu home, you're cementing that link between the spirit world and the living. It seems to work as an idea anyway. And I talked about how this was a, a fantastic museum. And one of the things that I loved seeing was this, which is they had a huge pottery workshop and these were the dogu that uh, that uh, a particular school group had made. So they were being exhibited at the museum. And then we heard that um, about two, three weeks later, the, the school would come and collect them, give them back to the pupils, and then another section would be on display. And so really engaging people with their prehistoric past. And probably at this point, it's worth me trying to give some idea of what period we're talking about. And also how, for us, there's some quite challenging concepts about prehistory in terms of the way that we think about them, about prehistory up, uh, out here in the UK. So you've got a timeline here, as you can see, of Japan, Eastern Asia, Western Asia, Europe, and America. What I'll really look at is these two columns, Japan and Europe. The little red triangle, as you see from down the bottom, is the first appearance of pottery. So in Japan, Japan is the place where pottery is, in inverted commas, well, it's either there or Eastern Asia, perhaps China. Pottery is invented at about 13,000 BC. Now for the UK, that's absolutely solidly in the Mesolithic. In fact, to the very beginning of the Mesolithic. So um, in fact, for some places back into the Paleolithic. So that doesn't compute because for us, Mes um, pottery equals Neolithic. And um, so in the, this period that they call, the, in Japan, they call the Jomon period, starts at 13,000 BC, and it runs through to roughly 1,000 BC, 17, well, 750 BC, something like that, 
really, as far as we're concerned, more or less into the Iron Age. So you've got this huge period of time, which a huge amount happens, but it's all called a single period. And it's split into, as you can see, incipient, initial, early, middle, and late. Um, the early, middle, and late was the initial divisions, and then people realized that actually pottery was first made 13,000 BC. So it, you know, things have moved on uh, in terms of that understanding. You may be able to read just here, it says Oyu at about 2000 BC. So these stone circles are in this late period or late German period. And the photos, this one shows some of the earliest pottery dating back to this sort of period, about uh, 10 to 13,000 BC. And these are middle and late Jomon period pieces. And you can see the sophistication and uh, the, the, the thought that has gone into the design of the, this amazing pottery. So for us, this is really quite challenging because those of us here in the UK, well, we don't get pottery until 4000 BC or thereabouts uh, in the beginning of the Neolithic. The other shape, color shading is agriculture. So we get agriculture coming in at about 4000 BC, the beginning of the Neolithic. In Japan, it doesn't appear till this period about 750, the beginning of what's called the Yayoi period. The key thing about that is that's when rice is introduced and that's when agriculture really hits. And that comes, uh, that technology is introduced from Korea. And that's the beginning of those much closer links between Japan and Korea and China. And so that sort of defines in many ways uh, 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 Japan in the early historic period. The period before that, there are no links, very few links. There are some, but not, not much. But they were not, uh, they were not, it was not agriculture, it was hunter-gatherer economy. But there's a bit more to it than that because they were tending plants and they were um, tending animals, but it wasn't full-scale agriculture in the sense that we would define it. So, as I say, this needs a bit of, for me, it took a while to get my head around this because it is so different from what we would expect, you know, the nice, neat hunter-gatherers, pottery, farming, Neolithic, job done. It's not like that at all. So, that's Oyu and an introduction to the chronology. The next place we went to was Isidotai, uh, again, more stone circles. And here, um, again, very similar structures. Quite ephemeral in our terms, rel scattering of relatively small stones in a couple of circles. Um, and there are, I think it's five or six circles here from memory. And you can see the way that the, uh, the site is very carefully manicured, very much looked after. Um, what you don't see is the, uh, the, peop the, the gentleman who was with us uh, the curator of the site carried a warning bell because one of his predecessors was killed by a bear. The bears love the chestnuts and they don't want anyone. And if there's someone in the way between them and the chestnuts, that's their hard luck. But what you can perhaps see are the mountains. So this is um, the mountains here are a, nat a, a nature reserve. Nobody lives there. Um, you know, it really is kept as a, a sacrosanct nature reserve, and this is a reserve particularly for the bears. And again, very similar picture of amazing pottery and these dogu. And you can see it's exactly the same principle where people were, um, the bees were buried with people, smashed up, and the pieces taken home, or some of the pieces taken home. And this is a particularly famous one. Um, which is, if you like, the, um, the light motif, the, um, the, the, the logo for the museum is this dogo, because it's one of the very few that all the pieces were in place. And one of the things I, I love is that the, um, this, uh, these stone circles were buried under volcanic ash. And the only reason they were found was because a road was going to be, was in the process of being constructed and uh, there's actually a road uh, pillar for the bridge that was going to span across the river and would the other span of it would have been on top of the stone circles. So the road um, has now been diverted um, and 
they use the the pillar that was going to be one of the bridge abutments is now the stage for their Jomon festival held on the second, second, second Saturday of September every year. And the river alongside is teams with salmon. And it must have done in the Jomon period as well. And so the, um, the site is on um, uh, a plateau between two rivers, both of them teeming with salmon, fantastic views across the sea and the uh, the mountains, perhaps the place where the spirits of the ancestors live. <laughs> Follow on from Mike Parker Pearson's theories about Stonehenge and Durrington Walls. So the re real pride. Now, the reason I sort of highlight that is until recently, the Jomon period was thought to be not interesting by many sort of people in mainstream Japan. There has been a complete resurgence in interest uh, of in the Jomon period now that much more is understood. Um, this is a little aside. Uh, this was, we stayed, in, uh, we're very fortunate in staying in uh, some amazing places. This was certainly one. This is uh, in a, a small town and this is, this is the hotel room. No, the bed isn't missing. You know, this is, this is the uh, futon on, for the floor. Um, but the reason that uh, Simon chose this hotel is it has a bath suite uh, linked to the hotel. So if you get, get up in the morning and go and have a bath. And the bath is very much like a Roman bath, and you're presented with a very small towel that is, I'll say this tactfully, rather too small to cover your modesty. So uh, it's not mixed bathing, it's uh, men in one, ladies in another, in another bath. So great fun, really gets you uh, wake, woken up in the morning. Great fun. We then moved on to Hirusaki. This is not the stone circle. You see we're moving further north. And this was uh, an amazing uh, palace. So it was the palace of the, uh, the shogun ruler of the, that pre prefecture, essentially the, the county, if you like. Um, here you see um, there's a, the, the, his castle is enclosed by a moat. And this is the gatehouse. And this is the keep. And you can see we were there in the autumn and the most fantastic colors of the, the trees. And they had a, a, a flower festival on uh, while we were there. We were sort of walking on a Sunday morning through this amazing flower festival. And you could just see the colors of the trees. It was just gorgeous, just jaw dropping. So on to more archeology, span Komakino stone circles. And um, this, is, uh, is, is essentially a large, there are two circles, but this is the main one. And you can see a double enclosure here and then a smaller one in the center. And uh, this is the sort of enclosure on the outside. And here you can perhaps see there is another one of these stone settings, a single upright stone weighing something like, um, uh, was it, it's 500 kilograms. So, and this is about waist high, uh, surrounded by a setting of stones, but a very similar picture to the, uh, the, stone, the stone circles that we've been looking at before. And this is really quite, there's really a lot of investment of time and effort in creating this stone circle because what they've done is um, taken out, they've terraced into the hillside to create a flat area. And then the stones of the circle, rather interestingly, are put on the slopes that have been created from the, by, the, um, by the terracing and then linked on the, the outside by um, a, a, across the terrace, creating uh, really quite an interesting shape. And of course, the reason for that is the view. Again, this is uh, on the terrace looking out over uh, the sea, looking out towards the island of Hokkaido over here. Uh, this is Aomori, which is the prefectural capital um, and the floodplain of the sea. It's thought that at the time when um, the stone circle was created, about 2000 BC, the sea would actually be lip lapping at cliffs just here. So we'd been looking out over the sea. And today there is a, um, a, a figure which is still aligned on the, from the, um, which is probably on the base of um, a Jomon period 
stone setting and those that and the stone setting in the center of the circle actually make a line which lines up with again with the, um, the setting sun on the summer solstice so it's really quite interesting evidence of solstitial alignments and um here there are clearly more burials and i found this really quite interesting and i've just realized um which is these are objects buried with one burial. You have uh, a stone scraper or knife, very much like some of the absoid, um, discoidal knives that you find in the late Bronze Age, in, sorry, in the early Bronze Age, and um, flint arrowheads. And this is an axe made of jade. Now, of course, in the UK, in particularly in uh, my museum, and I've just realized I forgot to insert the picture, so you'll have to in imagine it's there, which is this is the jadeite axe that we have that was brought from uh, the Northern Italian Alps. For the, uh, the stone circle um, uh, in uh, here, the jade for the axe comes from uh, the western coast of Japan, uh, which is something like 500 miles away. So again, just like in the UK and in Europe, um, there's a series of long distance exchange routes. Um, this arrowhead, if I'm if I'm right, is made of obsidian, which is over a thousand kilometers away. So just like in the in the in the Bronze Age here in Europe, long distance exchange routes. And you can imagine the. Uh, uh, the uh, jade tax. We uh, then went to Aomori, which is the prefectural capital. And one of the things that really struck home was uh, the main shopping street had these concrete bollards, but on top of them is a dogu, and alongside were graphic panels talking about the stone circles. And uh, you know this is really celebrating the the extraordinary prehistoric finds from this part of uh, Japan. And Aomori um, and several of the other prefectures in this area um, have worked together to, um, uh, to create uh, a, a plan to manage these sites together as a World Heritage Site. And if all goes well, the, um, the, the nominating committee have recommended that the, um, the uh, the Jomon prehistoric sites in northern Japan are nominated as a World Heritage Site this year. Uh, the World Heritage Site Committee is meeting right now, and I was hoping they might even have been able to announce that it had actually been nominated before my talk today, but it'll be over the next two or three days, so keep an eye out for that. A very appropriate given that the Olympics, uh, will, the Olympiad will be starting any minute now. So, and we met uh, the Minister of Culture and we met um, the, those leading the World Heritage Site bid. And we were able to talk about how the World Heritage Site, uh, the Stonehenge and Avery World Heritage Site is managed here in the UK. And we were able to shop, swap experiences. And the, the next site we visited, Sanai Mariyama, Mario, <laughs> Mariyama. Uh, I did get in practice, but I'm afraid it's got it got out of hand a bit. Um, and this was a, a quite a different site. This was a, a settlement site, and this is the site museum. If I understand it correctly, they spent something like thirty five million pounds on this development. And you can see here the way that the bus service. This was we were there on a Monday, uh, and the museum was closed, but the bus was still going there. Um, and huge numbers of people come and visit the, the site each year, uh, really is a major tourist destination. Um, this is the other side of that main entrance building, and it gives you an idea of the scale. You can see someone walking along there, it gives you an idea of the, the, the amazing investment that's been made into, uh, the, into the site. You can see at the back some pylons, those are in the process of being removed to enhance the World Heritage Site. And this is a settlement site, a major settlement site. And what they've done is to recreate some of the buildings that were excavated. And so you hear, see here individual huts, which have interiors, uh, including boards here with uh, Japanese characters on. And you can see the fire and the pot. I'm very fond of pots. 
But there was also a substantial, in other words, whacking great big uh, central um, hall. And this structure, which this is how it's reconstructed as a six post um, watchtower, really. But what's absolutely fascinating is where they could, they, inc they um, put undercover buildings, the evidence of what was there. So these are the six timbers of that watchtower. And these are the post holes. And in the bottom, being sprayed to keep it uh, damp, these are the remains of the chestnut trees that were that watchtower. So not on its, the watchtower as reconstructed, not on its original site, but you can see the watchtower and you can see the evidence. Uh, and again, they've done that with several of the houses and also a midden, a shell midden, where um, seashells were thrown after being, uh, after the contents had been eaten, after they'd had their fish supper. And this is the interior of the hall, and it really is the same scale as a, as a tithe barn, like the one at Bradford on Avon, for example. Absolutely enormous. And you may remember from the, uh, the, the, the timeline, this is about between two and a half thousand and two thousand BC, so roughly contemporary with uh, going to walls, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Amazing. And this is a uh, the excavation of uh, a cemetery, because again, uh, there's a cemetery here. No evidence of a stone circle, but here in the some there are there are is some surviving human bone. So you have the pots, people buried in or with the pots, and dogu as well. And they then tell this, this story in an, a jaw-dropping exhibition. And one of the things that I loved was that they take the story of this little girl and they use her story, to uh, her life story, to tell you different things that are going on uh, in her life. So here she has been given a jade bead by her mother to signify that she has come of age. You can see her brother attempting to chop down a tree, but here her mother is showing her how to tend a chestnut tree because the chestnut trees were a key source of food uh, for the Jomon people. That's one of the reasons they didn't develop agriculture in quite the way that uh, we do, you know, that uh, happened here in the West, really because they were so efficient at uh, obtaining food they didn't need to. Having a, a stand of chestnut trees was food for the winter. You've got rivers teeming with salmon, you've got food and you know no problem. Balls in the forest, easy. So they were tending plants, they were looking after animals but not agriculture in quite the way we mean it. And then this uh, reconstruction here, this is the girl and she's mourning her parents, uh, who she's just buried. So, you know, taking life full circle. And picking up on what I was saying earlier about where things come from, I'm afraid I, have, I can't remember what on earth these materials were, but this is where the site is, the very tip of the, the southern island in Japan. And you see here where material, where all, uh, different materials have been brought to the site. And uh, that's something like a uh, sort of one and a half thousand kilometers. So it gives you an idea of the, the, the amazing uh, trade route, well, the exchange routes that were in place uh, in prehistoric Japan at 2000 BC or thereabouts. And then as I'm a museum curator, I love to see the stores and these are their stores. So glass wall there, so this is all visible. And you see here the reconstructed pots from the excavation. And what about this? Look at that for a gleaming floor. Um, you know, I, I, this is the dream of a curator, I have to say. I, I kill to have stores like that. Um, absolutely amazing facilities. You know, that's just, I, I've never seen anything like it. Then our last major port, port of call was here, a, play, uh, a city called Nagaoka in Nig Nigata province. And um, the reason we came here was that this is the place where the really distinctive style of pottery called flame pots were first discovered in 1937. Um, this is the Umataka, Umataka uh, 
Jomon Museum in uh, Nagaoka. And the, what we were hoping was that we would be able to do, uh, essentially set up a twinning project with them. Um, but unfortunately, COVID got in the way. They've reconstructed the, the, um, uh, the house where the first flame pot was found. This is it, and you can see uh, reconstructed inside, unfortunately chucking it down with rain at the time. And this is some of the pottery vessels that were excavated. And these are these flame pots, called so-called because around the rim you have these protuberances. They're so, uh, what's the word? Lively, exuberant, that's a better word. Incredibly exuberant, very plastic and really you know, absolutely amazing. Again, these pots were used for cooking, but also there's a suggestion that they may have had something inside them they may have had charcoal little fires inside and then the fire would have um uh, would have sent flickering flames and sh cast shadows onto the uh, into the house so these things are absolutely amazing and here's here's one where you can just see the skill and quality and of workmanship that's gone into this and you can see perhaps here i think this is this is a bird molded into the pottery vessel absolutely extraordinary if all if it hadn't been for covid we would have borrowed one of these that would have uh, linked to the artwork that was inspired by this jomon culture and in return we were going to lend them um, a beaker and a collardern um, to show the so essentially compare and contrast between the pottery that was in use in prehistoric wiltshire at the time of stonehenge as to compare with what was going on in Japan at roughly the same time. And uh, here's the British Museum team sizing it up. They, can, um, they were, uh, this is the exhibition curator and conservators, looking at making sure that the pot, the pot that they had selected was going to be safe to travel. So this pot, all being well, and I've got everything crossed, will be coming to the UK. Um, it if, be for an exhibition that should be starting next year and will tell the story of the links between um, William Gowland, Japan, Jomon culture in Japan and Stonehenge. So this will be one of the main uh, foci. This will be this real centerpiece of the exhibition. Um, other material uh, coming from a couple of the other places, several of the other places we've been talking about and also lent by our colleagues at, um, at Salisbury Museum who have lots of material, obviously, from Gowland's excavations at Stonehenge. Then we went to what I thought was going to be a long drive, but actually was about a mile up the road to the next museum, which was um, the Niigata Provincial uh, Prefectural uh, Museum. And again, this is telling the story of uh, the Jomon people. And what you see here is quite literally a life-size diorama reconstruction of various elements of prehistoric Japanese life. And you see here pigs, them sort of this is a woodland setting on the outskirts of the village. And you see here the making uh, the, um, the, the, the pots. Now, just to give you a sense of scale, this really is full scale, full life. So it's like, it's like walking, the only thing I can think of it is like walking into a sports center. And what you've got is full you know full scale trees you've got you know the, the whole thing is like walking into a life-size film set it's absolutely extraordinary and there were several of these um which just brought the whole thing to life absolutely you know i've, I've used the jaw drop the word jaw, jaw dropping about three times already and i have to use it again for this um the scale and, and imagination that's gone into this is absolutely fabulous and that was our last, last stop. We then headed back to Tokyo uh, and for home. Um, we were able to visit the, the National Museum. And I just picking, you know, you know, so many wonderful things, but I just like to pick these things out, which look really quite bizarre. And for me, they really highlight how much we have to guess about what went on in prehistory. Um, these were uh, these objects were made by the Ainu people. That's you can see here. It says 
A-I-N-U, the Ainu people. They lived in the northern um, island of Japan and their culture held out, if you like, against the um, the more the, 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 the cultures were more dominated. It was sort of inspired by Korea and, Japan and China. And it's possible that, that the Ainu people and their culture preserved many aspects of Jomon culture. Um, it was for many years was not people didn't think it was very interested interesting but people now are very interested uh, in it and are really celebrating Ainu culture. Now these are um, two ear, essentially earmuffs these as it says there these accessories adorn bear, bear cubs which were regarded as descendants of the gods. What it doesn't tell you is that these bear cubs were then sacrificed. So creating the um, in the, the link, the sort of part of the ceremony, linking the sacrifice of a bear to uh, looking for a good season for the year ahead. But if you were to find something like that on an archaeological site, if you could find anything, because you know it's made made largely of organic material, you would have no idea what they were. But they have a really rich significance in the uh, the ceremonial life of the Ainu people. Uh, there was, of course, an exhibition about uh, flame pots and the Jomon people. So these rather lovely eye goggles. We had, uh, were going to churn out thousands of these for the exhibition we were going to host, but unfortunately, uh, weren't uh, the exhibition didn't happen. And then finally, we held a symposium at the uh, the university in Japan, and you see here the team again with, with our Japanese colleagues um, and these. Uh, uh, the seminar was very much looking at themes of world heritage and collaboration, uh, international collaboration. And after this, then it was uh, a 10 hour flight back to the UK via Dubai. So that's 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 an introduction to uh, sort of prehistoric peoples of Japan. Um, I've told you probably almost everything I know about prehistoric Japan and the Jomon people. I'm happy to try and answer any questions. A uh, huge thanks to Simon Kainer of the Sainsbury Institute, who made this trip just possible and made the exhibition that's going to be held in uh, by English Heritage possible. And if you're interested in finding out more, this book, Jomon Reflections, is available as a free download from Oxbow Books. It's about 80 pages long, full of wonderful colour photos, and really tells you everything. It gives a fantastic introduction to the Jomon people. So uh that's everything that's it that's everything i wanted to say so i'm happy to try and answer any questions that anyone has so over to you while i have a quick glug of water right. Let's see we've got a couple of questions so Chris has said, uh, fascinating to the longevity of Jomon hunter-gatherer life. If the raw materials for food are the reason for not moving forward into agriculture, is this parallel throughout Japan where geology and climate may be different and resources therefore different? Um, yes, it was parallel right the way through Japan. Um, but I think what the Jomon people would largely settle on the coast and they were really clearly dependent or a key element of their, their diet was seafood, particularly shells, and the huge shell middens. Um, but they were also uh, they were also living off fish. As I say, they had boar and actually appear to have introduced boar to different parts of um, Japan. So, you know, very much. Um, so although not agriculture in the sense of, you know, nice little pens and the boars were in them and they were being domesticated, certainly they were in making sure that uh, the, the food sources were plentiful. Um, and they were eating things like hair and all sorts of other things, as you might imagine, as well. Um, Claire has started to type a question, but not uh, quite finished it. Um, Sarah and Mike have said, great talk, thank you. Are the stone circles concentrated into a shorter time scale or found throughout the Jomon period? And how did they manage to create those wonderful pots? 
Right. The um the the stone circles do seem to be from this period around two and a half thousand to two thousand BC. But a, a key problem for Japanese ar uh, archaeology is the lack of uh, organic material and therefore the lack of carbon dating. So um, the Sanai Mariami, for example, you've got the chestnut posts which survive uh, waterlogged because uh, it wasn't uh, the, the soil was not too acidic. But in many most other places, the soil is so acidic, no organics survive. So dating can be is quite difficult for the other stone circles. Um, and how did they create the manage, manage to create the wonderful pots? Um, I think centuries of experience. Um, there are potters around, and I was very privileged to be able to meet some who are creating, recreating those Jomon pots inspired by the traditional designs. Um, I would love to be able to watch someone making them, but unfortunately, uh, didn't happen. We were toying with the idea if we'd been able to get the money to, to come over and to meet. Uh, and there's a, a chap called Graham Taylor who is uh, he, he runs a company. At a Joe Mon Potter and Graham Taylor in the same room, give them a whole bunch, um, a bag of clay, and then just light blue touch paper and retire and see what happens. Um, Steve Mar Steve has said, fascinating, dates are surprisingly early. He visited stone circles in West Africa, but they date from the African Iron Age around 800 AD. Yeah, well, Steve, you're quite right. And uh, nothing new under the sun. Um, there's clearly something in the psyche about creating circles and linking to solstitial alignments. Uh, the, the exact way it's, uh, that that's expressed is different in different places. And, you know, I'm, I'm struck also by the, uh, you sort of think about the megalithic temples in Malta, which are different to what we have in Northwest Europe, but clearly related. Uh, there are megaliths in Korea, uh, megaliths in Madagascar. You know, there are uh, related things all over the place. And it does make you think about, well, you know, we as humans are only, what, 80,000 years old as Homo sapiens. So I don't think it's too ridiculous to think that there are uh, sort of these common threads coming through from our links in the deep past. Now, Claire has said, uh, was the burial tradition during the long period before agriculture, cremation or burial? And uh, the answer is burial. Um, they're very, you know, there are pits. Well, he says that the evidence that survives is of burial. There are pits and they are sort of body sized um, or the uh, the sort of thatched huts that you saw at the edge of the stone circles. It's also suggested those might have been used for uh, sky burials. So the body would be exposed and then the bones gathered up and uh, uh, and buried then it's there are uh, sort of examples of both types of burial the site in on the sites where um, bone does survive and Lorian has said thank you fascinating you mentioned the alignment with the summer solstice was there evidence of the celebration of the other seasonal festivals um, the answer to that is as far as I know is no um it's just the solstitial alignments but of course the stone circles there are very different very much smaller stones um arranged in those settings so it's not so easy to have you know uprights but also of course you it's then more difficult for um people to invent alignments where they may not have existed at the time um now there's something that occurred to me oh what i didn't talk about was the stones themselves um quite often they're brought um, not long distances, but they're brought 10, 20, 30 kilometers from uh, often from the, uh, the beds of rivers, they're brought to the sites. So just like with uh, stone circles in the UK or Newgrange in Ireland, you, do, you have evidence of the very careful selection of stones and they're being brought to a ceremonial site. So there must be something significant about the choice of the stone. And Chris has said, Japan is a relatively remote archipelago. Is this likely to have impeded the movement of ideas from the continental mainland 
Therefore, again, the longevity. Uh, was the jadeite axe from Japan or further afield? Um, the jadeite axe was, or the jade axe, jadeite is what we get here from Italy. The jade axe was from, the jade is from Japan. There's some evidence of um, objects being, or materials being brought across from China and Korea, but it's uh, not a large amount. It seems to be pretty well self-contained, but I think they would have been aware and would have met people from Korea and China. But it well, certainly wasn't a sort of a constant, uh, a constant flow of ideas across across that bit of water. Uh, it, it, that really starts with the uh, arrival of the Yo Yo people, Yo Yo people. Is that looks as though that might be it for questions. You've certainly um, tested my my knowledge of. Uh, Japanese prehistory, I can tell you. Um, I'll just check the chat because there's a couple of chats there. Ah, and Ian has said, why would pottery start quite so early in Japan against the as compared to the UK? Um, yes, no idea. Um, I think that's one of those unanswerable questions. Um, Pottery to, to make pottery, you obviously need to have good quality clay, but also you've got to have a use for it and to decide what you're going to do with it. And presumably in uh, Japan, they were doing things like boiling up uh, chestnuts, boiling up meat rather than barbecuing. I guess it's as simple as, uh, as that, but uh, I have to say, I'm not sure. Uh... <laughs> Chris has said, uh, well off the usual map. It certainly was. And if you'd told me that I was going to get uh, be invited to go to Japan and work with colleagues from a whole range of Japanese museums and organizations, I would have laughed. It was, but an amazing experience. Um, so I think that's, that's all from me. What I would like to say is a big thank you, for everyone, for coming. Um, also to highlight, we've got, um, there's a few spaces left on uh, the walks that John Gervin is giving. He's uh, doing uh, w heritage walks around devices. The next hidden uh, Wiltshire uh, talk, uh, walk is on Saturday, looking uh, going to Bratton and Luckham Springs, uh, which is uh, a great thing to explore. And something I didn't get a chance to say earlier, but I think is uh, I'd like to say thank you to anyone who is on the call who uh, was kind enough to part, uh, take to contribute towards our um, appeal earlier this year. Um, Ali has been able to uh, get some extra things for her handling collection as a result of that, and we got got a couple of extra bits of kit. And um, she was giving two talks this morning, two uh, sessions this morning for um, online for two schools in London, which came as rather a surprise. She thought they were in Bristol, but uh, there are schools with the same name in Bristol and in London. So a big thank you to everyone who took part in that and very big thank you to those of you who are members for your continuing support for the society. So with that, unless there's anyone else, then um, yeah, I'll, I'll say goodbye. Oh, the only thing is just to clarify, and Alison has just said she's looking for, forward to the exhibition in 2,222. I don't think I'll be around for that, 2022, um, because the, um, the time, if you like, for the exhibition we were to have had has unfortunately been and gone. It's, it won't, it's just not possible to recreate it because of the other things we've got, got planned. So unfortunately, we won't have that uh, exhibition, but there will be one at the Stonehenge Visitor Centre, looking at the links between Japan, um, the Stone Circles, Stonehenge, and uh, William Gowland as the link between them. So big, very big thank you to everyone, and hopefully see you again next time. Bye, everyone. <laughs>